So hello and welcome from me also. I'm uh, Diana Hilcher and we're going to talk a little. Then uh, Paul's going to read a little something out of his new book, which comes out in March. So you can pre-order it at Amazon <laughs> and uh, then get it in March. And uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction again. And um, we want to start with um, about how you work, how you come up with the stories and why this story and why that story. Um, how is it to, to write historic um, novels? I mean, you, you, it's a thin line between you have to research on the one hand, on the other hand, you have to make something up and then still it's in your imagination, but something like that happens. How, how does that work? Um, so I, I think, thank you, it's an excellent question. Uh, I, I want to begin by saying that this is actually the, uh, the second historical novel I've written. The first one was a novel called Houseman or the Distinction, which was about um, the transformation of Paris as a city under Baron Houseman in the 1850s and 1860s. And my process for that book was kind of different. I lived in Paris for a while. I walked around, I had a sense of what the city looked like. And then I just kind of made things up and uh, hoped that they would be correct and I would check them here and there to see if they were. And to my surprise, they often were. Um, this book, The Night Ocean, which is about the American horror writer H.P. Lovecraft and his circle, um, and a couple of his close relationships comes out of a more, uh, a more calculated and deliberate process. I knew something about Lovecraft and his work uh, from childhood, and uh, a friend of mine told me the story, which I can tell later about, which became the seed of this book. But in order to write the book, it, I ended up needing to learn quite a lot about Lovecraft and the world and the time in which he lived, which was roughly the US, you know, in the, in the 20s and 30s, and then sort of the, the generation after him, um, in a lot of detail. And I think one reason that that's the case is because I became, one reason that it's the case is that Lovecraft is a kind of crazy person. And his life, although on the outside rather eventless, has a lot of very strange texture. And he was also friends with a number of extremely strange and extremely interesting people. And at a certain point, it turned out that what I could invent would be less interesting than what I could discover. And that the actual people who populated his life and who were influenced by his work were so weird that the best thing I could do was just learn about them and then try to set them down on the page. Um, and maybe I'll just leave it there, actually. <laughs> but, but do you think um, writing like this is harder than to just make something up? Uh, everything is hard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is harder in a way because there's all of this reading and thinking and sort of digesting that went into the book um, before I began writing it. The great advantage of doing that is that having done all that work, I kind of knew my world. You know, I had lived with it yeah. for a long time and I'd kind of lived in it for a while. And when I sat down to write the book, it wasn't as hard as it could have been because I already kind of knew where I was. Okay. So you mentioned Paris. Uh, Paris inspired you. Can we expect a book about Leipzig? Uh, maybe. We'll <laughs> see. I don't know. I find Leipzig very... It's a very interesting city and um, it's a very beautiful city and if I walk around long enough, who knows what will happen. But uh, let's get back to the night ocean. So um, it's, um, it's a historic friendship, right? So maybe you also mm -hmm. tell us more about the story because it's sure. between uh, Lovecraft and Barlow, one of his greatest fans, right? Yeah. So I don't know, I, I can't see all of you, but I don't know how many of you are familiar with Lovecraft. He was a, an American horror writer and he's probably after Edgar Allan Poe, both the greatest and the best known American horror writer. And then I suppose the next would be Stephen King in that succession. Um, but the story that I tell in The Night Ocean is uh, a little less well known and it concerns his friendship with a young fan named Robert Barlow. Uh, Lovecraft was a, a prodigious correspondent. He wrote something like 
a hundred thousand letters over the course of his life, and he died at the age of 47, so that's, that's a lot of letters. Um, and he would write to everyone who wrote to him, and he would write long letters, you know, 15 page, 20 page letters to anyone who took the trouble to write. So, a number of people wrote, read his work and wrote him fan letters, and Barlow was one of them. He was a, a kind of child prodigy who uh, lived in central Florida with his family, and he wrote to Lovecraft, and Lovecraft wrote back. And finally, uh, Barlow said, hey, Mr. Lovecraft, why don't you come visit me in Florida? And for some reason, Lovecraft said yes. And he ended up spending about two months with Barlow and his mother in a little town in central Florida. And okay, great, you know, fine, he did that. Barlow was 15 at the time Lovecraft was 44. And Lovecraft was also famously a recluse. He was someone who didn't spend a lot of time with other people. So there's a kind of historical question mark that floats up from this episode and you think, why? Why, Mr. Lovecraft, did you spend so much time with a 15-year-old? You know, I almost, I was sort of roughly the age Lovecraft was, and I like 15-year-olds, I've got nothing against them, but you know, I don't know why I would spend two months with a 15-year-old. So did you find an answer to that? The answer is there, you, you can't. Okay. The archive only goes so far, and that's kind of where the fiction begins. But is there something in there? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> and so what, hap what did they do? What happened between oh, them? Well, the things that we know that they did were sort of funny and mundane, and they toured the area. Lovecraft was very interested in old things, and it turns out there are a lot of old things in central Florida because the Spanish were there. Um, so, and they left all these ruins behind, and Lovecraft was very captivated by the ruins. And they, you know, they went boating in the Everglades, and they did kind of Florida things. How, how did the story find you? Or did you find the story? The story found me in the person of a poet named Robert Kelly, who teaches at Bard College. And I was the writer in residence at Bard quite a long time ago. Robert is a very distinguished poet. He's probably in his late 80s right now. And he's like, he's like a giant sort of walrus of knowledge. He knows everything. He looks like he knows everything. And we went out to dinner, and I, was, I admire his work enormously, and I was a little intimidated by him. But as we ate, the conversation drifted around to the subject of Lovecraft, and it turned out to my great delight that he had also been a Lovecraft fan. And we started talking about him, and of course, because Robert knows everything about everything, he also knew everything about Lovecraft. And he was able to tell me this story about Lovecraft's friendship with Barlow, and also about what happened to Barlow afterwards, which was very briefly, Lovecraft died young, Barlow lived on, he became a poet in Berkeley, California, and then he went to Mexico City and became one of the world's great authorities on the civilization of the Aztecs. And I thought, okay, these are actually some fairly interesting people, maybe there's a story here. So I went home and I looked them up, and in fact, they're, they're about as interesting as they seemed, and there was a story there, and I spent a while following it. So we're gonna hear something now, I guess. I'm so excited. Is it that time? Okay. Yeah, it's the time for the first part. Then we talk again, and then he's going to read again. <laughs> My husband, Charlie Willett, disappeared from a psychiatric hospital in the Berkshires on January 7th, 2012. I say disappeared because I don't believe he's dead, although that would be the reasonable conclusion. Charlie's army jacket, jeans, shoes, socks and underwear, though strangely not his shirt, were all found at the edge of Agawam Lake the day after he left the hospital. The police say Charlie's footprints led to the edge of the lake and nobody's footprints led away. Even if Charlie could somehow have left the lake without leaving tracks, they say, it's hard to see how he would have survived long enough to reach shelter. According to the National Weather Service, the overnight low temperature in Stockbridge was 15 degrees and Charlie didn't have an extra set of clothes. 
the girl who gave him a ride swears he wasn't carrying anything. What's more, no one denies that Charlie was suicidal. The last time I saw him in Brooklyn, he told me he'd taken a handful of Ambien just to see what would happen. What happened was he slept for 12 hours, had a dizzy spell in the shower, and sprained his ankle. My life is becoming a sad joke, he said, except there's no one around to laugh at it. He looked at me entreatingly. I told him there was nothing funny about an ambient overdose. It could kill you if you took it with another depressant. Thanks, Miss Merck Manuel, Charlie said. I'm still your wife, I said, and you're scaring me. If you really want to hurt yourself, you should be in the hospital. To my surprise, Charlie asked, which hospital? I thought about it for a moment, then I told him about the place in the Berkshires. Two days later, Charlie was on the bus to Stockbridge. He called me from the hospital that evening. I feel like I'm in high school again, Mar, he said. The food is terrible and everybody's on drugs. I nearly had a panic attack trying to figure out who to sit with at dinner. Who were the cool kids in an insane asylum? The bulimics look great, but the bipolars make better conversation. <laughs> Sounds like you'll fit right in, I said, and Charlie laughed. He sounded like himself for the first time in months. What had he sounded like before that? Like himself, but falling down a well in slow motion. Each time I saw him, his voice was fainter and somehow more echoey. That's something Charlie might have said. Normally, I am more cautious with my descriptions. I have never heard anyone fall down a well. Are you on drugs, I asked. I start tomorrow, Charlie said. Wanted to call you tonight in case there's anything you want to ask before they erase my mind. Don't joke, I said. I thought about it. What's your favorite nut, I asked. Oh, Mar, he said, you know the answer to that one. Charlie called again two days after that and told me they had him on two milligrams of risperidone, which was more than I would have given him, but never mind, and it made him woozy. But the characters, Mar, he said, the characters. He was taking notes in his journal for an essay he planned to write about his downfall. Take it easy, I said. If they think your journal is antisocial, they might confiscate it. I am, Charlie said. I've only got enough energy to write for like five minutes a day. The rest of the time I watch Lost on DVD. He didn't talk about his therapy, but I didn't expect him to. We had always respected each other's privacy. How long are they going to keep you, I asked. Charlie said, they're saying a couple of weeks. I said I would visit as soon as I could, probably the next weekend. Then, afraid that Charlie would draw the wrong conclusion, I clarified, I just want to know you're all right and that you aren't making the doctors miserable. Charlie said it was his job to make the doctors miserable. Then he said, just kidding. My job right now is to make a world I can live in. I wondered if he'd pick that phrase up in therapy and what dopey therapist could have fed it to him. What Charlie needed was exactly not to make a world. He needed to figure out how to live in the one that exists. All of that took probably two seconds. I'm happy that you're doing well, I said, and Charlie said, thanks. We hung up. That was on January 5th. On the 7th, Charlie forced the lock on his door with a bit of plastic, climbed a cyclone fence, and hitched a ride with a Simons Rock student named Jessica Ng. He told her he was meeting friends at Monument Mountain for an Orthodox Christmas celebration, and she, the fool, dropped him on the shoulder of Route 7. He waved cheerfully, she said, and walked into the forest. It's all in the police report. For the police and Charlie's mother and more or less everyone else, the last sentence of the story will be written in the summer when Agawam Lake warms up and Charlie's body rises to the surface. Only I do not believe he is dead. This, you'll tell me, is pure wish fulfillment. I feel guilty that I didn't save Charlie from suicide, so I've constructed a fantasy in which his suicide didn't happen. It's possible. Just because I am a psychotherapist doesn't mean that I'm immune to delusional thinking, 
and I do feel guilty. I lie awake wondering whether if I'd acted differently, Charlie would still be here. If I hadn't pushed him away in that last conversation, if I had been more patient, more understanding, if I hadn't moved out when I learned about Lila. Or I tell myself, because I was patient, was understanding, maybe my mistake was to keep my thoughts too much to myself. When Charlie came back from Mexico City with evidence of Robert Barlow's miraculous survival, I could have told him the evidence didn't add up. When he went to see Barlow, the person he thought was Barlow, I might have said what I felt, which was that the story was too good to be true. Even though I know what Charlie would have said, Mar, you're being mistrustful. I know it's hard for you to remember, but there are people out there who aren't crazy. And I would have sulked, because I hated when Charlie called me mistrustful. It made me feel small, and it wasn't true. My real mistake, I tell myself, when midnight comes around and I get out of bed to drink a glass of wine and listen to the BBC, my mistake was that I believed Charlie too much. Then I remind myself that I love Charlie because he was so unbearably easy to believe. Thanks. You said before everything is hard, but uh, what um, is the hardest thing for you about writing? Because every author has I guess, different steps uh, where they say, whoa, this is really hard for me. I mean, I mean they're all hard, I don't know. <laughs> the hardest part, um, uh, the hardest part is writing the words. Yes? Okay, I didn't expect I, that. Oh, I mean, I Because I, get I thought the, they are like coming out of you or something. <laughs> uh, and the rewriting or, or something. No, that's hard yeah. too, but that's okay. more words. <laughs> Um, so, how is it, what, what's, what's it like now being an author in the U.S.? Um, being an author in the U.S. now feels a little bit like being, I don't know, maybe this is an optimistic comparison, it feels a little bit like being a jazz musician. How is that? Well, you know, it's a form that has a great history and that was once enormously popular and that now is sort of practiced in specialized locations by uh, people with particular training and, you know, you're there and you're kind of singing or playing your heart out and, you know, there's maybe 12 people in the room. But you're living in New York. Uh, in upstate New York, yeah. 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 So there must be many people who read books and go to readings? Hmm. New York has a big literary culture. In a weird way, it's not a great book city. There aren't a ton of bookstores. There are people who go to readings, though, it's true. Um, I don't know, I love being here because there are so many bookstores in Leipzig. Okay. Um, you've been here when uh, Trump was elected, right? In uh, Germany? Yes. H how was that? Uh, it was strange. I was actually in Jena the night of the election. I was giving a talk in Jena on Wednesday morning, so I came down on Tuesday night and I stayed in a little hotel um, with a very, very slow kind of little engine that could style Wi-Fi. And, um, you know, I, I went to bed at a reasonable hour and I thought, I'll just check in the morning. But I couldn't sleep, so I'd wake up at you know, 1.30 and look at one little red state and think, oh, okay, one little red state. I'm going to go back to sleep. And I woke up at 2.30, and it was like four little red states. I said, oh, the red states seem to be spreading. You know, um, I think for me overall, the, expe the, the experience w was one of, uh, you know, of unreality. It's as it was for a lot of other people, because the expectations had been so different, and the polling had been so different. And there was a sense that we all knew how reality was going to go, and I guess you know, reality's favorite trick is to not go the way everybody thinks it's going to go. You're talking about that a lot lately, I guess? We, yeah, I mean, I talk about it with, uh, with certainly with uh, my, my fellow American expatriates, and I talked, I was in New York City last week, and there's a lot of conversation about it and sort of what happens going forward. Um, I think this is one of the great, you know, historical surprises, right? I mean, certainly of my lifetime. 
September 11th was a great historical surprise, but it wasn't clear for months afterwards what kind of consequences there would be. Everybody thought, oh, we'll probably go into Afghanistan, and of course we did. And then there were other consequences that, that unfolded slowly that we, we couldn't imagine. But it wasn't like, oh, we suddenly September 11th happened and we got a different government. And this is, this is surprising. You know, we don't really know where it's going to go. And you, you already wrote an article for Zeit Online, I heard. So I, wh what's this about? I wrote an article for Zeit Online, um, which actually came, it's a, it's a, it came out of a, a thought that I had um, writing the last novel I wrote before this one, which was a, a book called Luminous Airplanes. And one of the features of that book is a, a character who's very interested in a millennial cult called the Millerites, who are actual historical people. And they were, they were uh, active in the United States, mostly in the Northeast, but also in the Midwest, in the 1830s and 40s, and they believed that the world would end on, I think, October 24th, 1844. And that was going to be it. The Bible had foretold it. The world would end and the kingdom of heaven would begin. And so they all got ready by doing things like forgiving each other, which was very nice, um, but also giving all their money away and throwing, you know, getting rid of all their possessions, which seemed nice at the time. Um, and then they put on white robes and went to wait for the world to end. The white robes were very nice too, and they sang and danced, and that was very pleasant. But then the world didn't end, <laughs> you know, and they were all kind of in a quandary because they had given away all their possessions, and they'd really staked everything on history not continuing. And I was thinking about, well, why do people imagine that that's going to happen? I mean, of course, it's likely that the world as we know it will one day end. The planet will no longer be habitable by human beings. Whether we'll have gone to another planet or not by then is anybody's guess. But there's the historical sense that the end of the world is about to happen. It feels so strong. It's like, why do people think that? And it seemed to me, okay, one reason why people think that is because it's very hard to grasp the reality of historical change and to realize the extent to which we're in history. We're not just looking back at history as something that had all these funny twists and turns up to our kind of placid present, but that actually goes on and continues to twist and turn and, and take us in unexpected and terrifying directions. And it's easier to imagine history stopping than it is to imagine it continuing. So I was writing in this, in this essay about my feeling like, wow, I don't know what to make of this. This is very strange. But also, here we are really in history. We're in the middle, you know, and whatever is going on is going to keep going. And we can't just sort of climb up on hilltops with right ro white robes and wait for a better world to come. We actually have to figure out what's going on now. Well, we could. <laughs> sure, I mean, we could, you know, and, and maybe one day when I move back to California, I will. But in the meantime, <laughs> sorry not to knock California, which I love, but. But in the meantime, it feels more urgent to figure out where we actually are, which is not at the end, although certainly we're at the end of something, but, but in the middle of something that's continuing. So what does that mean for, for the people of the US, but also you know, here, everywhere? Well, I think one thing it means is that despair is to be avoided, right? Despair is a kind of millennial emotion. You just throw your hands up in the air and say, I don't know anymore. Come on down, you know, show me the answers at the back of the book because I give up on solving this problem, right? Um, and that's, that's a terrible option. Um, and I think another thing that it means is that you have to recognize historical change as real and sort of be where we are. And I think that in some ways, uh, the people I know, you know, got blindsided by, uh, by Trump's election. We didn't see that coming. But in a way, the people who voted for Trump are also being blindsided by history. Historical change is happening, and at least some of the people who supported Trump have a vision of turning back the clock, returning to an earlier time, making the wheels of history not turn. And that's, that's just as much a delusion as the delusion that you can just give up. How is it to talk about that here in Germany compared to talk about it with your friends back in New York? Well, there's a lot less crying here. <laughs> but, but are the, the questions different? Are they? No, I no. don't think so. I think that the people I've talked to here are very aware of what the stakes are 
I mean, as you say, it's not just a question for the U.S. You know, we're all kind of interconnected at this point by trade and treaties and travel and everything else. So, but you know, from the outside, sometimes it's different. The view of you know everything. I, the, the the folks that I've talked to here are are far smarter than to think that what's happening in the U.S. just stays there, and they're very aware that it affects them and it affects the you know the elections here next year and it's going to affect the French elections even before that and that everybody's going to be shaped in some way by these developments. But you do sound concerned though. Well, I mean, I think there's there's reason to be concerned and even even I you know, I think I probably implicitly let my politics out of the bag at this point, but even the the folks who support Trump I think have reason to wonder what's going to happen because there's there's so much uncertainty about what he'll do and what his administration will look like and how he'll reshape the kind of the global picture. This is not the story of our marriage. Still, I want to note some things that happened early on because they make what happened later easier to understand. Charlie and I were set up. His friend Eric was dating my friend Grace, and so, in accordance with the law that every young paired-off person in New York City has to pair off his or her friends, Grace threw a party in her Hester Street studio, and Charlie and I were invited. I didn't want to go. This was in 2004 when I was doing my residency at Weill Cornell, and I reserved my free time for sleep or reading the novels that piled up on my little glass top table. Also, the night of the party was very cold. But then I thought, Marina, if you don't leave the house, you're going to spend the rest of your life alone, or worse, you're going to marry a doctor. So I put on about six layers of clothes and feeling like one of the old Star Wars action figures Charlie collected. I didn't know about them yet, but now, 10 years later, Charlie images are what comes to mind. I took a cab to the Lower East Side. As soon as I got to the party, I wished I hadn't come. 30 of Grace's art friends were crammed into her studio, holding drinks close to their chests and shouting at one another over a mixed CD. It was like being in college again, and I felt a kind of despair watching all those people pretend that time did not exist. But it was so cold out that I didn't go home right away, and while I was leaning against the wall wondering if I had changed since college, Grace came up to me and shouted, Marina, I need your help. I left my inhaler somewhere, and now I can't find it. With a familiar, mild irritation, Grace was always losing things, always asking for help. I headed toward the bathroom. My path was blocked by a large plastic rabbit, spray-painted gold, and while I stood before it, wondering what it was doing there, a boy asked if I knew where the rabbit had come from. Probably from a gallery in Williamsburg, I said, and the boy, who was, of course, Charlie, laughed. He told me he had seen a rabbit just like this one once in Memphis, and he'd discovered that it came from a chain of restaurants called the Happy Rabbit. The chain was founded by a Chinese immigrant named William Lee, and the amazing thing, Charlie said, although I didn't know his name yet, the amazing thing, he said, was that Mr. Lee actually served rabbit because he believed that in the future, nuclear war would make it impossible to raise beef cows or even sheep. Like many other people, Charlie said, he was preparing for a future that never happened, or at least one that hasn't happened yet, I said. Charlie grinned. It was as if he'd thrown a football into some trees, and I had not only caught it, but thrown it back to him. Actually, he said, I'm not sure this is one of the happy rabbit rabbits, but it could be. He was skinny and stooped, with a scraggly goatee and hair clipped close to his skull. His skin was light brown. He wore a green army jacket over a blue paisley shirt and red pants. A motley outfit, I thought, as if he were protecting himself by playing the fool. He wasn't the man I had dreamed of meeting, but my dreams were confused and the men I did meet were often good-looking jerks. And then it was midnight and everyone else had gone out to a bar. We were still standing beside the rabbit. Suddenly, Charlie asked, is it all right if I kissed you? I said he might as well. 
What do you mean I might as well, he asked. Well, I said, no one knows when that nuclear war is going to show up. But this isn't the story of our marriage. It's not the story of how quickly Charlie moved in with me and stood Han Solo and Darth Vader on my bookshelf in front of D.W. Winnicott and George Eliot. It isn't the story of how we got married at City Hall with Charlie's mother and my brothers as witnesses because my parents refused to come down from Connecticut to watch me marry a Schwarze or how we posed in front of a photo mural of the Statue of Liberty, and Charlie remarked that the statue was exactly the wrong symbol for people who were getting married, and I punched him in the ribs. What's important is that I loved Charlie because he made life lively. When I met him, he worked as a fact checker at the Village Voice, and in his free time, he wrote profiles of people who could have been famous or should have been famous but weren't, because of some stubbornness in their character or some flaw in the world. He didn't make a lot of money, but that didn't matter because I was making enough. After my residency, I was an attending for two years at Mount Sinai. Then I went into private practice doing analytic psychotherapy, which I believe in and which I'm good at. What Charlie was good at was immersing himself in obscure and beautiful facts. He loved the people he wrote about in a way that I sometimes envied but would have been afraid to imitate. As a therapist, you get to care deeply about your patients, but you can't love them without sacrificing the neutrality that makes therapy work. For Charlie, there was no limit. When he was writing about an employee of the Oakland Department of Motor Vehicles who had invented a purely rational language and was, so far as anyone knew, its only speaker, he learned the language. He and the DMV employee conversed in it. I listened with amazement as Charlie clicked and clucked into his phone, scribbling notes on a steno pad balanced on his knee. But when I read his profile of the language inventor, I understood why he had put so much effort into the research. I could see the DMV employee standing at the breakfast bar of his bachelor's apartment He'd invented his language, he said, as a way to make sense of things after a bad divorce. Eating a baby Ruth and licking chocolate from his fingers. Was that what you were talking about? Candy, I asked. Uh, no, Charlie said. Actually, I intuited he was a Three Musketeers kind of guy. You intuited? Yeah, Charlie said. Sometimes when you get deep enough into someone's head, you can kind of see things. It's like you become them and you're seeing the world through their eyes. Of course, I asked him about it after I wrote the first draft, Baby Ruth. I was pretty close, right? Why was Charlie the way he was? As we got to know each other, I couldn't help coming up with some hypotheses. His parents were both professors at Columbia, his father in English, his mother in philosophy. When Charlie was 10, his father, who happened to be black, was accused of sexually harassing several of his female graduate students. He cried racism, but Charlie's mother, who happened to be white, left him anyway. Charlie's father died of a brain tumor before the charges were resolved. These events, coming one after another, sent Charlie into what I would have called a serious depression. He called it his passage through the underworld. He lost interest in doing anything and in seeing anyone he hadn't known before his father died. The only exception to this rule was the game Dungeons and Dragons, which he started playing when he was 12 and played more or less nonstop until he turned 17. I had the little figurines and everything, he said. It was a total obsession. Even my nerd friends were freaked out. I had to play in the back room of a hobby shop in Midtown with these Asian kids from Stuyvesant and some guys in their 30s who were probably repressed sexual predators. But that was how I met Eric. He was as messed up as I was, or more so. We used to take the bus together to D&D &D tournaments in New Jersey and Pennsylvania and so on. We'd stay up all night and come back on the bus in the morning and go straight to school. It was like we were on drugs, except that we didn't even drink, and we did super well in the tournaments. There was this one time we were playing through the Tomb of Horrors, and Eric and I were the last two survivors. So what happened, I asked. 
trying not to smile. I killed him, Charlie said. The first place prize was a $20 gift certificate. A man has his priorities. I meant, why did you stop playing, I said. Charlie blushed. I went to Princeton, he said, and met a girl named Megan who was into Pablo Neruda. Long story short, I turned over a new leaf and became the outstanding writer of nonfiction whom you see before you. Traces of the old Charlie were still easy to spot. I don't mean that in a judgmental way. Nothing has led me to believe that people can change their deep selves. The best we can do is to fit our dispositions into the real world, and Charlie did that. His profiles didn't make him famous, and they certainly didn't make him rich, but they were a joy to read, even if you had no interest in the things his almost celebrities were almost famous for. He took their obscurity and lit it up with his caring. The only sad thing about his work, I thought, was that it was connected to his father, as if he were still trying to salvage his lost, flawed dad, who had spent his professional life looking for traces of colonialism in the poems of Sir Thomas Wyatt the Younger. I didn't tell him that, but I wonder if anything would have been different if I had. Probably Charlie would have grimaced and said, Mar, you're a great therapist, but you're not my therapist, so please shut up. But maybe it would have sunk in anyway, and he would have been more cautious when he met Elsie Spinks. Actually, I think he must have known by the end that he had to let his father go. I think his disappearance was a way of letting go, not a great way, but the only one he could imagine at that point. More wish fulfillment, you'll say. Maybe so. The most terrible of my midnight thoughts is that Charlie took Elsie Spinks with him to the bottom of Agawam Lake, not in reality, but in his heart, and that my husband is there now, deep in cold water, curled around the memory of the worst father he never known. Thanks. Uh, so thank you very much for your reading. Very interesting stuff. Um, my question in the, uh, in the first part that you read, mm. I think it was Charlie who said, well, my, my job is to um, make a world that I could live in, right? Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly. And to me, that sounded very much uh, Lovecraftian, if mm. I dare to say that. Because when I, <laughs> I can imagine him kind of living in Brooklyn at that time, mm. in the 30s, um, in, in Red Hook, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, which was very much a changing um, city, a mm -hmm. changing part of mm -hmm. New York, um, with immigration and the world changing um, kind of around Lovecraft, who was, who was a recluse, as you already said, um, and he was kind of embattled by that change. So and he also he tried to write that um, or uh, just um, process that change in that weird stories that he wrote, right? Mm -hmm. that, monsters and all that, that mm -hmm. stuff that is today very much part of a nerd culture as was very well reflected in your uh, reading also, the Dungeons and Dragons and everything. So my question then would be, um, as an author, would you also say that your job would be to make um, a world you could live in? That would be my question. Um, I think I want to say, first of all, that's a very, it's a very intelligent and perceptive um, characterization of Lovecraft's work. I would, however, question whether Lovecraft was making a world that he or anyone else could live in. It seems to me that the hallmarks of Lovecraft's work, which I find fascinating, are that he's created a cosmos in which human beings are more or less helpless in the faces of vast cosmic and extra cosmic beings, which will crush them utterly with no hope of the humans ever winning. We're doomed. So it's a world we can, we can enjoy reading about. We get a vicarious thrill from the, the despair of the inhabitants of his world and their ultimate recognition that, that humanity matters not at all in the cosmic scheme of things. The best that we can hope for in the Lovecraftian cosmos is to aspire to the status of food. Um, so I don't know how livable that world is. I certainly wouldn't want to live in it, although I mean, I may already live in it, you know, for all I know. Um, 
That said, I think if you mean by live in the sort of the restricted sense of live in the world of your mind the way you live when you're reading, then absolutely yes, you're making a world for the reader to live in, I think more than you are for yourself to live in. Um, making a world for yourself to live in is, you know, in a way e an easier task. You could just play World of Warcraft or, or you know, or, or something like that, um, or just make a lot of notes about how you know, you've discovered unified field theory. I don't know, but the problem is making a world for someone else to live in. And that's where the, the difficulty and the generosity come in. And Lovecraft certainly did that. He didn't make a pleasant world, but he, he did make a world. And I, I'm trying to do the same thing. Um, so uh, you mentioned that Lovecraft uh, was obviously a horror writer, which is probably not the happy camper genre of literature. Hmm. And you also mentioned that he was a hermit. And now from your reading, I was surprised that you decided to start the story you're writing about him with the story of love, basically, and yeah. that you're also going to focus on what might or might not be his only friendship he ever had. So I was just right. uh, surprised by, by this choice, which seemed a bit right. um, somewhat contradictory from how you c characterized I, Lovecraft as an it, author. Yeah, I think in a, in, a, in a strange way, it's actually very straightforward. It's the missing, it's what's not there. It's the blank spot, right? Lovecraft's cosmos is, uh, how can I say it? It's dazzlingly void of love. And Lovecraft's biography is also quite light on love. The, Lovecraft is his real name, but you can only take it as a kind of cosmic irony. Um, it seems to be the one thing in which he had no interest and with which he had very little experience. And yet, Lovecraft was a human being. He wasn't a, he didn't come down from the stars in a pod. Um, and like all other human beings, he experienced love both as its object and as its subject. And so what did that look like? And I think that if you, if you dig a little bit into Lovecraft's writing, as in fact, if you dig a little bit into his biography, you find a kind of yearning and there's a kind of a, a wish for something like love or for something like delight. I don't want to just say, oh, he wrote horror because he was lonely. You know, this is really a man who wrote 100,000 letters. He had a lot of friends, even if he didn't see them very often. He was very connected to other people in the day-to-day, -day, you know, like the way a blogger is connected. He was always online, if by online you mean writing letters. Um, but I think that there's, that love does show up in his work and trying to kind of go back through and think about what part love might have played in his life as a human being seemed to me like an interesting question. What's the relationship between love and horror, right? Are you working a new, on new material here in Leipzig? A little bit, but it's way too soon to talk about anything. I'm just just walking around and, you know, making notes. Observing. Um, what would your advice be for people who wants to write, like, two sentences? Um, I mean, the only way to write is by writing. You know, it's, there's nothing you can do except actually work and just keep making work and keep making more work. I mean, it's very, like, in a way, it's very straightforward. But thinking about writing only takes you so far, you know, and then actually you have to sit down and write and pages have to happen, and then they're terrible pages and you throw them out, but you learn something by writing them, and then you use that to write the next thing. It's just, just kind of constant work. Thank you very much for the reading and uh, everything, uh, Paul Lafarge, and we also can uh, talk while eating brezeln, I guess, and uh, drinking some lemonade. We have all this here, and uh, we can get to know each other more and talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. And thank you for being here. And uh, yeah, let's have a nice time now with the Britzel. <laughs>
Well, first of all, I'm, I have to admit that I'm personally very invested in that topic, as you might have noticed from my uh, prolonged kind of question. And um, Lovecraft is a fascinating subject. The time that Lovecraft lived in is a fascinating topic for the historian, also in literature. And um, I think what he did, what I got from his excerpts that he read, is that he tried to give it a kind of a postmodern spin where he kind of disassembled and reassembled Lovecraft's culture and Lovecraft's time and put it in, in our current age and um, made it so that Barlow, who we understood was this 15 year old kind of super nerd who was a huge Lovecraft fan in his time, is that that nerd that is transplanted in our time, who plays Dungeons and Dragons and other kind of nerdy culture stuff. And um, I'm very, it would be very interested, uh, interesting to see how that plays out in this book, because I think he, he's really got something there which interests me personally. So, but well, the book is not yet out, so it's hard to tell um, how, it, how that develops in the book. So I really liked the reading. Again, the Picador professorship always makes for a great evening. It's really inspiring to meet the authors that come here. It was a very interesting topic. Uh, I personally did not read yet anything of Lovecraft, but it definitely inspired me to do so. Um, so yeah, it was great fun and very thought-provoking. <laughs>